All right, it's time to continue. I've got coffee. You could hear me sip if you're just listening and not watching the video. Welcome to chapter... Mm, I don't know what chapter I left off on. But honestly, this book is not uh, separated by chapters. It's separated by feelings. It's, um, 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 you should read, you should listen to this book, um, um, just click anywhere in the video and then start there and it will, it will still make the same amount of sense, which is a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense, this whole book. So really, mm. all right, here we go. <laughs> We are almost ready in a day. Oh. Oh. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Be, 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 be. Yeah. Okay. Fine. We're ready. In a day. Four. Three. Two. One. <sighs> okay. Welcome to part two of The Guide for Souls in the Future. Written by Arnold Gallows. Narrated by Arnold Gallows. I, oh, okay, also, I realize my um, accent sort of <laughs> slowly goes away the more tired I get of reading for an hour and a half straight. So um, I'm going to try and not make that happen again. We'll see. We'll see what happens, but... Uh, you know what it is what it is um um entropy happens you know it's, it's all good but anyways whoa but anyways is actually the first two words of the next part here we go <laughs> oh god oh that stinks ah uh, there go a few uh brain cells I don't need them anyways. Here we go. But anyways. Johnny had a knack for building buildings and dusting off bases on football fields and riding clouds off into space. So Johnny was still looking for a job. He needed to find a newspaper so he could look in the wanted ads. So then he went to the nearest store and then the nearest store was a store by the name of... Dot, 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 I forgot. It was such a bl Oh, wait, where's my accent? It was such a blasphemous name. Oh, yeah, I remember the store. Was called... I remember the store was called The Store. The store was a pretty crazy store. Johnny walked in and tried to buy a newspaper. He saw a newspaper. It was on this elephant with green tusks. The elephant was sleeping, so Johnny had to carefully sneak up to the elephant so the elephant wouldn't wake up and rampage through the whole store. So then Johnny tiptoes towards the elephant and he slowly moves his hand towards the newspaper. He grabs a hold of the newspaper and then he pulls the newspaper off of the elephant and then right when he did that, the elephant... There we go. The elephant's tusks were not green anymore. They were striped yellow and red. That was a sign of angriness. But the elephant was still asleep. So nothing exciting really happened. Except that under the newspaper was a book. Johnny looked at that book. He felt something draw him in and want to pick it up. So Johnny picked the book up. On the cover it said, The Guide for Souls in the Future. Johnny was amazed and he wanted to read it. It was an old, old book. Johnny thought that it was probably from approximately June 18th, 2005 at 11.48 a.m. But it was just a guess. <laughs> So then, yeah, the book was all dusty, and it looked like it hadn't been touched in over 69,028,235 years. So he opened it up, and then a moth came out and flew out and around the store. It flew around through the magazine shelves, the candy shelves, and the slurpy machine. But it was all... it was flying away, not... It, but it was flying in a way not imaginable by puppies, ducks, sticky notes, CDs or floppy disks. Uh, 
It was twirling around and it didn't know where it was going. Like when you're intoxicated, your body and soul... When you've intoxicated... When you've intoxicated your body and soul with alcoholic beverages, except that the moth wasn't stupid enough to do that, so the moth probably just couldn't see right. It was probably trapped in the guide for souls in the future for quite some time. 69,028,235 years to be exact. So then after flying around and around the store, it began to slow down. Its wings flapped less and less. Its altitude was dropping. Its breath was getting softer and its end was getting closer. It fell to the ground. It tried walking and flying back up, but there was no energy left for that. So it twitched and twitched, and after a short while, it decreased from moving. It deceased from moving. It had died. The moth was the moth then disappeared like rain after you've watched the news and it said there wasn't going to be any more rain. The moth was v- evaporated outside of existence while Johnny started reading the book on the first page it had the title of the book and it said the guide for the souls in the future under it was a name it was the author of the book his name was a name of a god I cannot say the name the name cannot be spoken therefore the name shall not be known then under the name was a phrase the phrase only stated only less would get you more Johnny was confused Johnny was befuddled he read it and almost wanted to shed tears and yet he wanted to burn a whole building down and he and yet he wanted to spread joy and yet he wanted to not be mean to anyone (laughs) he never knew what he felt he always wondered what he had felt and if it was real it was an insane feeling you get like when you jump off a three-story building and land in a big bowl of jelly and then the jelly turns into pudding and then after a while it turns into gravel well johnny read the book and it contained a big old story that was really cool so he thought everything in it was real and stuff so then he starts making little figurines of characters in the book he even made a symbol for the book it was an ant wearing a corinthian leather tutu then he made millions and millions of those little figurines and symbols he thought it was real Then he gave those figurines and symbols to everyone in the world. They all made copies of the book and used the book to find something to believe in. They made big houses called perches. The perches were houses of the author, and people came to worship the author because they needed something to believe in. So they worshipped the author even though the author is me. So by explaining all of this Bible-like stuff about how this book will be used like how we use the Bible now in the future, then no one will, would believe that this story would do that. So Johnny was walking down the street one day, and he saw Curly Sue and the calculator zebra. So Johnny came up to Curly Sue and asked her for a hairbrush. So then Curly Sue was like, I have a hairbrush. Then Curly Sue gives Johnny a hairbrush. Then she asked why he wanted a hairbrush. Then... Right after she asked him that, he threw it into the ocean. Curly Sue then freaks out, and then she she calms down and asks Johnny why he did that. Johnny was all like, because New Zealand isn't a country anymore. Then Johnny scampers away with one of his legs behind his neck, and then he trips and he gets back up, and then he keeps scampering away. Then he falls down one of those circular sewer things on the street. He falls down and enters the world of rats and garbage. The world of rats and garbage was a big world full of rats and garbage. Well, then Johnny was walking through the tunnels and then he saw pictures of roly-polies on the walls. There was also paintings, there was also paintings of many people like Louie, that one fat guy who got his own cartoon. He looks like a pig. (coughs) 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 Well then, as Johnny went through the tunnels, he could, he still could not find a big carpet. He needed the carpet so he could place it in his house in the real dimension. When he looks around for carpets and, well, he was looking around for carpets and then he found some. They were actually the exact same carpets he had in this house. 
Then Johnny freaks out because he has a flashback of him throwing the carpets away when he was making the popcorn. He shouldn't have thrown them away in the first place if he was just going to get them again. That's pretty whack. Well then, Johnny found the carpets and looked for a way out. He looked for a ladder leading to the streets. He went searching and searching, but he couldn't find one. Then after a while searching, he finally did find one. He was about to go climb it when all of a sudden that fat guy from the carpet commercials comes up to Johnny and says, Johnny, I want my freaking carpets back. You forgot to pay tax, you loser. Then he comes charging at Johnny, and then Johnny dodges him, and then he falls into the mud, and Johnny laughs at him, and then Johnny climbs up the ladder. He pokes out in the street, except he wasn't in the street. He was in a monkey's pancreas. He didn't know what to do. He looked around, and it was very pancreas-like. Johnny then turned into a ghost, and then he came out of the monkey's pancreas. Well, then he... What was that? (laughs) Then he turned back into a human again, not a ghost. Then he forgot about his carpets. So then he looked at the monkey. Except it wasn't a monkey's pancreas. It was Johnny's own pancreas. Johnny came out of his own pancreas. Yeah, that, that... Then along came this phoenix. It was a firebird type thing. It probably came from Phoenix, Texas. Phoenix, Texas... Or Arizona. Well, then the Phoenix started rapping about his car and he got a Mercedes Benz and his 24 inch rims. Then the Phoenix was. Then the Phoenix said, Well, Johnny, I once knew a rhinoceros and I once made him cry, but I vowed that I would never do that again. So the Phoenix never did, get, did it again. Then the Phoenix dug a hole in the ground that was in the shape of of the cross like in church then he walked yo he walked and around and it looked at and looked at it so it was upside down he was like whoa you can see it from your point of view johnny it's upside down and when i see it it's not upside down that must mean i'm way cooler than you so then johnny went on a mission to search for the facts and fibs and fables but along came the principal of his old high school johnny never liked him he was too mean everyone called him mean dean in high school well he accidentally fell into the cross hole then the vice principal came and was like hey Where did my master go? Then he hops into the cross hole. So does Donovan McNabb, but not Cleopatra, because she was dating Antony at the time. Well, chandeliers of hope hung from the ballroom of love as the carpet of trust supported the table of stability, which was holding the tablecloth of cleanliness. On the tablecloth of cleanliness was the cup of juice. Johnny drank that juice and he was... And he was like, Sunny Delight tastes better than the cup of juice spilt on the table of cleanliness, which made it not clean, which made the table of stability fall due to the tablecloth's uncleanliness. Then the broken pieces of the table of stability were all over the carpet of trust, which made the carpet untrustworthy. (laughs) And the ballroom of love was heartbroken as its carpet, table, tablecloth, and cup of juice were all destroyed, which then made the chandeliers of hope fall to the ground, and everything and everyone became hopeless, unloved, untrustworthy, destabilized, and unclean. Hoodoo. (laughs) Uh, Though the juice flooded the whole place, and world hunger and thirst was solved, and though one mistake was made, it caused many other mistakes. However, more mistakes can make happiness. Then Johnny was like, whoa, I didn't mean to say that about the juice, and I didn't mean for the cup to spill. Sorry. Then Johnny went out of that place. He came upon a big room of powdered sugar. Powdered sugar was everywhere. They were in tiny, huge, mountain-sized piles. Then Johnny looked to his left, and he saw nothing. Then he looked to his right and saw a tiny, giant donut. (coughs) 
Then Johnny looked at, to his left and he saw nothing. Then he looked to his right and he saw a tiny giant donut. Did I just say that? Then Johnny rode into the mountains of powdered sugar and he had so much fun. It wasn't even funny. So then when he got bored of it, he lied down on the piles of powdered sugar. He then saw that the donut was turned into a powdered donut. Then when he was eating it, he thought he was bleeding because there was red all over the place. Then he realized that it was the jelly inside the donut. Then he ate the whole thing, and he was pretty darn full. Then he hung out with some of his friends outside of the place with all the powdered sugar. They were all intoxicated with alcoholic beverages, so then everyone was all like dumb and common senseless. So, then Johnny had a reputation of being the dumb one of the group when when they were all sober, but now that they were intoxicated, then he became the smartest one of them all, since he didn't intoxicate himself. Love and happiness needed to spread, though happiness and love never attained the weakness of modern sobriety. The world should not fear. <clears throat> Johnny was prancing in a field of tulips and daisies when in the sky he saw bowls of pineapples. There were bowls of pineapples in the sky. Don't ask why. Well, Johnny found a shack by the field of tulips and daisies. In the shack, he looked around for something to eat. There was nothing in the shack to eat. All that was left was frozen peas in the freezer and a jar full of lima beans with one stick of celery on the bottom of the jar. But twins were, in fact, available in the shack. Twin dishes. They were exact twins. Well, one of them broke, and then the forks and spoons got so mad, and they scraped themselves on the dishes, and it made an irritating and ear-piercing noise. Then all of a sudden, Johnny yelled, The early beaver gets the morning wood. Then the dishes were asking why he yelled that. All the trash can said was, if you don't sink, you'll think. Then the sink thunk, thunk and dunked like a punk on a banana split ice cream pocket pack. So never again will his mother be interrupted by her own bizarre hand claps. So Johnny was in the shack when all of a sudden there was a hobo sitting on a pile of books. He sat there and stared at Johnny like Johnny was a human-sized hamburger. The hobo had a pair of shoes on his hands and a pair of gloves on his feet. He wore his hat on his buttocks. Well, he had a buttoned-up plaid shirt that was a very plaidish. Like it came from plaid land. Plaid land was a land full of plaid. Plaid donkeys, plaid plaid shirts. You name it. No, I don't want you to name it. Because then if you name it, it might suck. Because you can't name anything, you loser. Well, the hobo asked Johnny... Do you have some loose change, buddy? Then Johnny stuck his hand in his pocket and looked for some loose change. There was there was lots of tight change, but no loose change. <laughs> so then he checked his other uh, pocket and it contained, well, lots of loose change. Uh, but then Johnny thought, I shouldn't give money to a worthless little hobo. Then Johnny said to the hobo, um, I don't own any loose change, dog. Then the hobo just stared at Johnny with no expressions. Then his mouth started to frown, and then one single teardrop came out of his left eye. That single teardrop shined in the sun with one small sparkle. It blinded Johnny, and what Johnny felt when he saw the hobo cry was the most sorrowful and sympathetic feeling he'd ever felt. He felt like he was going to cry as well, but he took it like a man and held his tears in. Then the hobo suddenly walked out to the door, and then Johnny followed him out and said, I'm sorry, dude. Then Johnny came out. Right when he came out of the hobo, out, the hobo started to fly to another sky. Johnny just stared in amazement. Then Johnny realized that he was no longer a hobo. He was a magic hobo. Those are pretty rare, and you could only find those in magic shacks and sometimes in holes in the pieces of the cheese. Then an elf came up from a magic stone from the magi. The elf saw that Johnny had the nickels, dimes, and quarters in his pocket. So then they duked it out in the field. Johnny 
pulled out his long sword, and the elf took out his daggers of swiftness. Johnny took one long swing at the elf, but then the elf just dodged his attack, and the swiftness of the daggers put a big gash in his arm. Johnny fell to the gr- Johnny fell to the ground with his body shaking in close defeat. But Johnny had a brave and courageous soul. He stood up with a determination of defeating the elf. He then ran straight for the elf, but the elf didn't dodge his attack. The elf was stabbed in the hair. The elf couldn't believe it. Stabbed in the hair! So then the elf was so surprised at his hair getting stabbed that he dropped his daggers of swiftness. The elf was no longer equipped with the swift daggers. Now it was Johnny his chance to destroy the elf. The elf was just about to get swung at, at when the when a tulip came out of the ground and grabbed the long sword and threw it into the field's cliff. It fell down the cliff, getting scraped along the way, and when it reached the bottom it exploded into a fiery explosion. The cliff bottom dwellers in the bottom of the cliff were dead due to the explosion. Johnny felt sorry for them. Because they were family friends that jo- that babysat Johnny when he was little. One time Johnny was eating a plate of spaghetti. Johnny was a little baby on his high chair. And then he took a meatball and threw it in the babysitter's face. It got stuck in the babysitter's eyes for days. And days and days and months and days. But that's... That was when they didn't know that their fate was to be destroyed in a fiery explosion caused by a long sword that was drawn by two little ruffians. So then Johnny was all sad. Then he was like, oh well. Johnny then was suddenly attacked by the elf. He knocked Johnny down by the edge of the cliff. Johnny took his foot and threw the elf off of the cliff. Johnny looked down and saw him falling near the bottom. And then Johnny turned away because he couldn't look at the disgusting sight of the elf hitting the cliff bottom. (laughs) Then he was lying there face up, staring at the sky, taking deep breaths and panting. Then all of a sudden the elf surprises Johnny from the back. And then Johnny gets out his guns and shoots the elf and the elf flies down to the cliff bottom. Then Johnny relaxed when he did that. But then the elf was back and grabbed Johnny's shoulder and was freaking out. The elf was was then pushed by a daisy and then the elf fell. Johnny was getting pissed because the elf popping out stuff wasn't stopping. Later the elf popped out and grabbed Johnny by the hair and said, You idiot. Then the elf slipped on tomato skins and banana peels the elf fell back down the cliff what a rough time johnny couldn't believe how crazy the elf was so then johnny lied down on the ground and then the elf popped the elf popped back up and uh, grabbed johnny's hair and johnny was like no not my hair then the elf never realized that he was about to fall again because the grip on johnny's hair was slipping then the elf grabbed onto the cliff edge then a chunk of the cliff edge broke loose and the elf didn't fall down with it but then he realized that he did fall down with it then johnny watched the elf fall down onto the cliff bottom then he lied down on the ground again he knew it was over then all of uh, all of a sudden the elf comes back and grabs johnny by the ear and johnny's ear falls off and then the elf falls down again then the elf landed on a computer the computer was attached to this girl by the name of Cecilia! Oh man, Cecilia was alive. Then the computer opened up a spring program. Then the spring program made the computer download a spring on top of the computer. The spring caused the elf to spring back up to the top of the cliff. Then the elf grabbed Johnny by the eyelashes and Johnny was yelping in pain. Then Johnny blinked and then the elf lost grip and and fell down. The elf fell under the purge. The Purge was a stone that went on many adventures with a boy named Robin. Robin was a freaking weirdo who had adventures with a stone called Purge. (laughs) He was a freaking weirdo. Well, the elf then popped back up, and Johnny uh, grabbed Johnny by the navel. And, well, uh, and the elf popped back up and grabbed Johnny by the navel. The navel was the worst part to get grabbed on by in that dimension. So then Johnny screamed and panicked and didn't know what to do. So then the elf was like, I'll go if you give me a monkey. So then Johnny gives the elf a monkey. Then when the elf received the monkey, the monkey pushed the elf off of the cliff. Then the monkey and Johnny high-fived each other. They became best friends, and every time the elf came up, 
the cliff. They'd push him down together. They, they, they w- would bl- they blew bubbles together, played video games together, played go fish together, and of course, while still pushing the elf down the cliff. But then from a bush came this evil zoo co-worker catcher guy. D- wait, this evil zoo worker catcher guy. He had come to catch the monkey. Oh no, the monkey was scared stiff. Then the evil zoo worker catcher guy stuck out his hand, and it stretched all the way out to the monkey, and he grabbed the monkey. The monkey was freaking out, and so was Johnny. The monkey bit the evil zoo worker catch a guy, and then almost got away, but then he grabbed the monkey's tail, and then he threw the monkey in his evil zoo minivan. Then he drove off, and the monkey was looking out the window at Johnny as he drove away, and all Johnny was yelling was, Monkey, I'll get you back, don't worry. Then a year passed, and Johnny totally forgot about the monkey because Johnny won the lottery. But all Johnny wait, but all Johnny wasted that, but Johnny wasted that money, all Johnny wasted that money on was, 69,028,235 pounds of brown spaghetti. Brown spaghetti was spaghetti that had been left in the refrigerator for 50 years. It loses its red and saucy color. It gets stuck. It gets sucked out by the refrigerator's coldness and by the oxygen slowly taking the moistness and sauciness of the spaghetti and trading it with brown and brown chunky sauce. That looks disgusting in the eyes of the beholder. When you take a bite of the spaghetti, it doesn't taste good as freshly prepared spaghetti. So then Johnny thought it was freshly spared... Freshly prepared spaghetti. But when he got... But what he got was brown spaghetti. There were even some dried up crispy noodles, the noodles on top. But Johnny couldn't stop thinking about his larynx. He knew that the brown spaghetti... He knew that brown spaghetti caused the larynx to implode. But luckily, a bottle of placebo pills saved his life. So he got his hands and face all gross with brown spaghetti sauce. So he used a moist towelette to clean off his face and hands. He used the moist towelette to cleanse himself. Italics are way fun. These these things are in italics, Um, said Johnny. So Johnny wet. To the Red Bunny Lounge. At that, all right. Side note. At that point, I'm like making only certain letters, <laughs> italicize. Um. So yeah. Anyways, to the Red Bunny Lounge. The Red Bunny Lounge was a lounge that had dancing and raving. It was like a dancing rave thing with those little glow sticks that last for like 24 hours, which is pretty crappy. Just when Johnny stepped in, a glass of lemonade was thrown at him, but it stopped in front of his face and levitated in front of him for about three minutes. Stanky. Johnny was Johnny just stared at amazement, and after the three minutes, the lemonade hit him square in the nose. You think Johnny would have moved? I guess he wasn't smart enough. What a dumbo! So there was lemonade juice all over his eyes, and he couldn't see it all. He ran forward, not knowing where to go. And then the ravers with the glow sticks started pouring the glow stick juice in Johnny's eyes as well. And then Johnny was freaking out like a cat after a bubble bath with Dana Carvey in Stapler Land, where metal is not an object but a life form agency. Well, Johnny freaked out like a spout that never runs out. Pieces of paper were in his air hair, but he couldn't feel it because he owned hands, and he placed his hands on his hair, and he f- and felt the pieces of paper. Johnny looked at the pieces of paper, but then he realized that his eyes were still blind. So then after he realized that his eyes were still blind, he, ar- he realized that the pieces of paper contained braille. Braille was those little dots that blind people used to read. In case you didn't know... I was just assuming you didn't know, but if you did already know, then I'm deeply sorry. Well, Johnny read the braille. It said, bump, 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 Then Johnny realized that he didn't know how to read braille because he just got blinded from the lemonade juice a couple of minutes ago. 
So then, <laughs> so then a police officer comes by and eats bacon in front of Johnny's face, and then all of a sudden, Johnny could see again. Then the police officer dug a hole in the ground with a shovel that he found in Sigmund and Freud's basement. The police officer had no idea why he was digging a hole in the ground, but then he realized that he was doing it because he was burying a diamond ring that belonged to his ex-wife, who had passed away. She passed away so fast that you couldn't even see it on the court. Yeah, in that dimension, way meant basketball sometimes. <laughs> but not all the time. <laughs> well, she was an a WNWA. <laughs> She was in WNWA, Women's National Way Association, uh, as an all-star all -star baller. She was the shiz knight while well, the police officer was burying the diamond ring because his ex-wife didn't need it anymore. She was too busy passing away. She passed away many times in her life. That was basically all she did her whole life. She passed away. <laughs> she never shot the way, but she always passed away. But never in the police officer's mind would he imagine that turtles grew legs, not through brown bags, but teal bags. So the police officer took out his gun and then squished it really hard in his hands, and it disappeared into thin air. <laughs> His nightstick did the same as well. They had a celebration filled with nothing but peace. The police officer and his wife. Their love, ever-changing, filled sorrowful nights with envy. Johnny was like, whoa. Johnny w could see again because of the bacon eating. And Johnny covered his eyes. His left eye with his right hand fist and his right eye with his left palm flat on his eye. Never did he learn self-control. He didn't do it. It was the world. Johnny didn't accept, expect for the celebration to end so quickly. But he did know that wounds would heal unless intoxication occurs. It reopens and makes you feel like it's uh, catching back up to you. It's gone, but you don't know how it got back. Johnny then was still at the Red Bunny Lounge, serving himself up with some margaritas and vodka he was at the bar and the bartender couldn't stand to give everyone free drinks so then he charged a dollar per shot but johnny didn't want to get tipsy he was too smart johnny only paid half a dollar so the bartender gave johnny a half filled half empty shot johnny also asked for some lemon juice with the half shot so technically it was a full shot because the bartender put half lemon juice and half vodka so johnny drank the mix sip by sip the lemon juice's flavor stuck out and he didn't even taste the vodka it was 50 percent vodka johnny liked the taste of vodka and yet he didn't he loved the lemon juice the vodka didn't seem like it did anything it was basically pointless Johnny watched the other intoxicated zombies sitting next to him at the bar. He watched as they chugged down their shots. But not me, no, but not one. Not a single one was drinking it slowly and peacefully and enjoying every taste. They chugged. Some of them even plugged their noses. They didn't and never liked the taste. They all forgot the meaning of drinking. The purpose of drinking anything is to taste it, but they chugged because they wanted something else. They wanted to be intoxicated love zombies. They chugged and chugged. They didn't even like the lemon juice, so when they ignored the taste of lemon juice, they became blind. They all needed some police officer bacon eating in their lives. They did nothing but lie down on unsober field puking their guts out soon enough after everyone went to the bar they were all intoxicated love zombies the only sober person left in the entire building was johnny johnny then had the unpleasant but righteous job of ex escorting the intoxicated love zombies into soberville then out popped doni tiaz and he said humpty dumpty humped and dumped a rump with his lumpy stump
Then he ran away screaming, Christine is such a freaking Ewok, so hairy. So then Johnny just ignored Donny and his crazy ways. So then he had to first get the intoxicated love zombies out of the Red Bunny Lounge. Johnny first tried dragging them, but when they were outside, they went back in, so that didn't work, so he got so frustrated once that he yanked one of the intoxicated love zombies' arms off. Then Johnny had to help each one of them walk. He just escorted them out of the building somehow. Then they all tried running away from Johnny to go to Domino's and Pizza Hut and Safeway. But the real Safeway was... But the real safe way was to not go to Safeway, but go to Soberville. They were walking, and then they all pissed a lot. They were like intoxicated love zombies pissing, intoxicated love zombie pissing machines pissing everywhere. But at least they weren't dead. They made it through Danny Tunnel, and one of the intoxicated love zombies pissed in there. Tony's sign-in sign imprinted on the third plank of the fence they then they were out in the third street from first avenue they went down stumbling and stumbling and watching out for curious car drivers then johnny took a left and went towards soberville but the buff intoxicated love zombie took a right and they all went they went towards on soberfield the heavily intoxicated love zombie was sick out of his mind he got way too dizzy and began to throw up they were all laying on the field watching out for curious car drivers they all just drove by due to johnny's idea of laying down they all lied down on the ground looking at the stars as they pondered about nothing nothing at all they were intoxicated love zombies and uh, they couldn't ponder until johnny started asking questions the questions were like tests to test if they were sober birds they answered most of them right but the lanky intoxicated love zombie answered a few wrong he was intoxicated by the gates of laurie and smith they knew that the lanky intoxicated love zombie was intoxicated well they all were still on on sober field drowning their hearts up with woe and misery that was delivered from the intoxication by the evil the evil was something that couldn't be explained, and I cannot even explain it to you now. It cannot be typed on to paper. It cannot, you cannot see it. It's the stuff that's in everyone and everything. Ironically, it's what keeps us alive and happy. However, it also can be the most evil and cold-hearted thing on the planet that will destroy us until we explode, and the evil shall whip us and wake us, pick up our bones and fossils that we have left behind after our explosion. We cannot th even think up a way to destroy the evil, therefore the evil lives on. Well, Johnny and the intoxicated love zombies were still in up sober field. Then Johnny had the bright idea to get going, so they picked up their pace and tried going to Soberville. They went through the other exit of the unsuper field because there had been a three-foot pencil with two plastic bags for lungs and a noble jouster for a nose. The noble jouster had a shield, and on that shield and it had the emblem of walking weasels. Walking weasels were weasels that never seemed to run, swim, hike, sow, kiss, or jog. They just walked. If someone carried the emblem of walking weasels, then he or she would not be able to run, swim, hike, sow, kiss, or jog. So the three-foot pencil was lucky and didn't have to worry about getting runny noses. Well... The three-foot pencil's lungs were two plastic bags, and one of them said marketplace, and one of them said NN's. Well, the NN's plastic bag lung was just making fun of the marketplace plastic bag lung. Sometimes he said marketplace is a market waste, or sometimes he would say marketplace should get kicked in the face. Marketplace never knew how to tie its shoes to, and has always made fun of him for that. Then one day, as the three-foot pencil was... Getting his hair done, sharpening. He couldn't breathe because of the wood chips that flew into his mouth. It, it all went into the NN's plastic bag along, and it started shriveling up and shrinking and getting very sick. Then the three-foot pencil was taken to the emergency room. Luckily, call emergency was there too. Call emergency. <laughs> The doctors looked inside of the uh, three-foot pencil's insides. They found that the Ennin's plastic bag lung was very sick and shriveled. 
The doctors decided after a brief discussion meeting in the doctor's discussion room that they, the only way for three foot pencil, that the three foot pencil could survive was by replacing the end plastic bug lung. Then the doctors did the operation by using tongs. They then replaced the... Who is... Then they replaced the end plastic bag lung with a marketplace plastic bag lung. Then the doctors sewed up the three foot pencil and everything was fine. The two market place plastic bag lungs just made love to each other and then they had marketplace plastic bag lung babies and then the three foot pencil ended up with 69,028,235 pla- market plastic marketplace plastic bag lungs they had a honeymoon in Reno and then they got arrested for development in the third nature of Zimbabwe 5 the after planet well, Three Foot Pencil chased Johnny and the intoxicated lump zombies around, and then they escaped the unsober field. They were on the road. The road of toads. There were many toads on the roads, but also on the ro- toads were roads. Well, on the roads that were... Well, on those roads were roads of toads that had roads of toads on that toad of the road. Road is a weird word. Well, they were on the road of toads, the first one. Then they weren't on the road of toads later because they took a sharp turn towards the path of destruction and hair picks. Well, the path of destruction and hair picks got his name because one day a construction worker guy was driving to work one day. He stepped into his workstation and the boss had told him to put the sign up for the street by the road of toads. So then the construction worker got up and went to the e went to the sign storage center. He picked up the sign for that street. Then he placed it on the back seat of his limo. Construction workers used limos instead of trucks because they found out that materials they use would work better if he stored it in a comfortable place and not in the back of a truck. And he drove off towards the street. He ran towards some toads with roads on them and the toads on the road on the toad of the road. The sign was sitting in the back seat, relaxing and having fun. He also tried um, prank calling people with the phone in the limo. One guy had caller ID, and then the sign got in trouble by the construction worker guy, but the construction worker guy couldn't yell at the sign because it would make the sign uncomfortable, and then the sign wouldn't work. Then he, he then escorted the sign out of the limo, and then he found the spot to place the sign he started to dig a hole in the ground when all of a sudden the ground started bleeding he was like oh no i'm sorry mother earth please forgive me then he looked closer and he just dug at some black cherries which looked like blood so then the two and a half squirrels came out of a ski mask and then they came to the hole with the black cherries and then they placed the black cherries in their cheeks and ran away to their ski mask and then the skier took the ski mask and placed it in his ski bag. He was late for his ski competitions so he just found the ski mask with the two and a half squirrels because he couldn't find his own. He was really late. He was as late as a duck. Ducks never cooperate is what Johnny's maid always said to him whenever Johnny caught ducks in his pond. Johnny placed them in a cage and the ducks died the next day. And that's what she said to him. Well, the skier was driving in the snowmobile made of Corinthian leather. Yeah, like the tutus. And he was driving up snowy mountain. Snowy mountain was inhabited by things many things like air and carbon dioxide and squirrels squirrels with attitudes well the skier was driving up snowy mountain through this rigorous trail that he was going through the map told him to go through that rigorous trail he got the map from the machine gun that lived in snow and couldn't come out of the snow because it can only breathe snow and nothing else he couldn't even breathe water of or fire. Well, when he got the map back there, it sort of scared him because he was driving by a snowman that was talking to him. The skier was like, Frosty, you're real? And then the snowman, machine gun, was like, shut up, you idiot. Frosty isn't real. I'm a really a machine gun who can't, who can only breathe snow. Now, isn't that more believable? Then the skier was like, yeah, dog. Then the machine gun snowman thing came, gave him the map to the ski competition, but he said that the skier had to go through a trail full of rigor. 
Some people called it a rigorous trail, but the machine gun snowman thing called it a trail full of rigor. Well, in my opinion, a trail full of rigor sounds 69,028,235 times better than the rigorous trail. Well, the skier looked at the map and the trail full of rigor was labeled. It didn't say trail full of rigor, really. It was rigorous trail, but you could see that it was crossed out and someone put trail full of rigor over it. And he examined the map and he followed it and said farewell to his friend, the machine gun snowman thing. They both waved goodbye in it. And if you look... And if you took binoculars, binoculars, you could see a single tear roll down the machine gun snowman thing's eye. It was very romantic in a way that I cannot describe. But yeah, in a way I could. Yeah, but in a way I could not describe the blade's birth certificate. Well, then the skier was on the trail full of rigor when he was stabbed by wanksters from the south side of the mount. He was bleeding, and when the wankster hollered... <laughs> yeah, that's right, N-word. <laughs> you just been jacked. Crazy N-word skiing fool. I ate pace dog. Well, the skier wasn't very pleased. He was bleeding internally. So then there wasn't any do any blood showing somehow, even though he had been stabbed with a knife. The, the cut just sewed itself back together, I guess. And now it's bleeding internally. He needed to go to the hospital as... He needed, he needed to go to the hospital as soon as possible. H-N-T-G-T-T-H-A-S-A-P. So then he was like, <laughs> so then he was like, oh, well, I'll just put that at the end of my to-do list. Be yourself. So then he was driving through the trail of full of rigor, not knowing what was ahead. He came across an iron giraffe that was imported from Europe. The Ryans were vacationing in, in Europe, the family with that one drummer. <laughs> Well, the iron giraffe was made of magnesium and not iron for some reason. It was like a robot. It was some. It was sort of like a Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. And if you look at it from the corner of your eye, it looks like a Stegosaurus. A magnesium Stegosaurus. Well, the iron giraffe just stared at the skier. The skier didn't want to get involved with that iron giraffe, so he just drove it by. But then, the next thing he knew... He was being rammed by the Iron Giraffe. The Iron Giraffe was out of control, and he was tailgating the skier. The skier panicked and pressed the oil spill button on the snowmobile. The oil squirted out behind the snowmobile, and the skier thought that the oil would make the Iron Giraffe slip and fall. But uh, the Iron Giraffe only sucked up the oil and made him go faster because he had a lot of hinges on him. Now he was going twice as fast as the snowmobile was... Twice as fast, and the snowmobile was getting badly damaged like a sack of potatoes in the back of an off-road pickup going up a very rocky mountain falling down. Well, the iron giraffe was still ramming the skier. The skier didn't know what to do, so whenever he so whenever he didn't know what to do, he'd just pull out some cigars and smoke some. So he did just that. He was doing that while driving, too, which wouldn't... Uh, make anything better but oh well he so he lit up lit one up and took a few puffs and he uh, felt lightheaded but he felt better then he passed it on to his buddy next to him in the passenger seat he was a snail but then the snail didn't know how to smoke a cigar so then the skier spent about half an hour uh, he spent about an hour and a half trying to teach the snail how to smoke a cigar so then the snail finally got it and then he actually dropped it on the ground of the snowmobile it made a mark on the carpet thing the skier was pissed but he understood because it was the snail's first time. So then he picked it up and it was all gross and dirty and then he had no use for it anymore. He threw it out the window. And then it went directly into the iron giraffe's mouth. It rested perfectly on the iron giraffe's mouth. But the skier got his binoculars that were hanging from his pinky toe. He took it and looked at the iron giraffe and there was a little label on his neck. It said, this iron giraffe is allergic to smoke. 
So then the skier was like, right on. The iron giraffe started getting a runny nose and it started coughing and sneezing and its eyes started getting irritated and dry. Then the skier realized that the iron giraffe wasn't made of iron. The iron giraffe was made of magnesium. And the skier went to Okaba High School and he had his teacher, he had this teacher by the name of Mr. Thayer for science. The skier remembered that Mr. Thayer said the, that magnesium burns. Also, he did a demonstration for class, and then he lit up some magnesium, and it was very bright, and it burnt fast. So then the iron giraffe lit up, and it made the most brightest light the skier had ever seen. The iron giraffe was no more. Then he slammed the brakes on really hard, and then the snail buddy went flying towards the windshield. <laughs> and then the next thing he knew, he heard a big splat. Snail Buddy had dropped his ice cream cone from his ice cream cone. He's dropped his ice cream from his ice cream cone, and then the skier sighed in relief, and he then slammed up the gas, and then the Snail Buddy went flying to the back window, and the Snail Buddy splatted on the back window. The skier was like, oh, darn. Then he was like, oh, well. He then kept going, and then he finally made it to... The ski competition. The skier almost fainted when he saw the ski competition area. He was so happy that he finally made it to the ski competition. He thought in his head the past memories of what and who he had encountered on the trip to the ski competition. He sooner or later forgot all about the whole trail full of rigor, and he went on with his life. So he went up towards the ski competition gate on the window of the booth lady's booth. A sign was imprinted on it. It said, I'd like to see the wailing ghost erase the imminent remorse. It was pretty insane. Well, the skier went up to the booth lady and uh, asked her, Hey, I'm pretty freaking late for this ski competition. I'm in it. Then the booth lady was like, Oh yeah, you are late. You're as late as a duck. Then the skier was like, Ha, no I'm not. You're lying. Then an angel on his left shoulder said, Oh, skier, you know you were late as a duck. Just admit it to yourself. Then a devil popped up on top of his head and the devil said, Nice view up here. Then they both disappeared and they got married eventually. They made a son and the son's name was Jesus. Spelled G Z G dash Z U S S. Jesus was the only per- the only son of the angel and the devil. They were two polar opposites. Combination of pair. Jesus. I never appreciate how donkeys were one of the low lives of the planet. Jesus sacrificed his blood and hair and Barbie hair supplies for all the donkeys on the planet who have sinned. Some of the donkeys' shins sinned. Sinning shins is a bad sign, but the sunshine was always shown on sinned shins. There are tons of shining, sinning shins of donkeys that wore shirts telling boys of the hood not to smoke crack and break nerds' big thick glasses for medical purposes that cannot be addressed due to high security reasons consulting of the FBI, female body imploders, and the CIA, Central Implosions Association. Well, the skier was like, okay, then out popped a choo-choo train engineer from the ground. He grew like in a fetus in the ground, and then he came up from the ground as a baby, and then he grew, and he grew, and then he was a little boy, and then he grew some more, and then he was a teenager with a kiss t-shirt and a beanie and long hair. And then he was a protein, where he had a job, and he wore a Kmart employee shirt, and then he was like, choo-choo train, and he was a choo-choo train engineer. He had a blue and gray striped overall outfit. He looked like a genuine choo-choo train engineer. He had pale green skin and a golden tooth. And then, and when you pressed on his belly, he made a sound like toot. But it was, if you listen hard, you can hear him say, I want anal thunder. Won't you have some today? The skier said no because he wasn't very thirsty. But the boy to his right said, hey, you're almost 30. And the engineer said, you gotta be joking. A boy like that didn't go to, didn't like to go soaking. Well, anyways, the choo-choo train engineer had a glass of anal thunder, a drink that people drank in the dimensions when they worked too hard at the careers. Then Henrico t- <laughs> took his mighty axe and he had slain the Hydra. Henrico didn't like what he did, but he did it with woe. 
and misery and pity for the Hydra. So the choo-choo train engineer had the glass of anal thunder and he gave it to the skier. The skier popped the cap off with his portable bottle opener that he found inside a pebble. The pebble was a container for por- of portable bottle openers. Well, that's what I had been informed. The skier placed the opening of the bottle onto his lips and he drank it. When the little molecules of anal thunder traveled towards the skier's taste buds, little waiter cells started welcoming them into the skier's mouth. They were the shape of spoons, and the head chef of the skier's mouth was in the shape of a plan that had been squished by a semi-truck that was heading east for its daily checkup for its engines and its semi-truck teeth. The doc said the semi-truck had gonorrhea. The semi-truck was pissed like all people when they just get informed that they have gonorrhea. Well, then one of the anal thunder molecules took out a gun and shouted, I'll write everyone down. This is a stick up. Then every little molecule and cell and organism screamed and panicked. <sniffs> then the skier sneezed, and for some strange reason, only that little anal thunder molecule got blown out. Then the an- another, the other... Anal thunder molecules were pissed because that was their friend. During this time, the ski had just tasted the anal thunder. So then the anal thunder molecules all turned into dark creatures with spikes and body odor. Then the skier felt sick and he threw up on the booth lady. Luckily, he didn't throw up on her because the window thing had been between her and the skier. But the cur- but then Curly Sue and the Penguin King of Asia suddenly made a rule that says throw up has... Throw up that has been caused by anal thunder can go through booth lady's windows. Then the booth lady was covered in flowers. Curly sued the penguin king of Asia received a telephone call from the dimension watchers because they were done surfing and they had a killer time out there. But anyways, the dimension watchers called up Curly Sue and penguin and the pink Curly sued the penguin and the king of Asia and told her that well, told her what was about to happen with the throw up and the window and the booth lady. So then Curly Sue calls his daughter, calls in daughter time, and she freezes time. And then Curly Sue writes a telegram saying, Thank you, daughter time. You saved my penguin ass. She sends the telegram to daughter t- time's address. Then, when the dimension was frozen, Curly Sue made a law that stated all throw up that has been caused by anal thunder would be in the form of flowers so then the booth lady had flowers all over her and then she saw a magazine on the ceiling and she looked at it and it said become a model she looked at it more thoroughly and she saw an article and said we're looking for someone who works at a place with windows we need someone with flowers all over them so then she looked at it and she suddenly was pulled into the magazine into her own little fantasy world where she was a top model and she was the coolest and Tyra Banks was her indentured servant. So then the skier looked at the choo-choo train engineer in the, in the magazine in the booth and he was like, dude. Then the choo-choo train engineer made a, show- made a shower right before the skier's eyes and he turned it on uh, and he stepped on it. And he was making funny noises and singing. And then he stepped out and he was wearing a woman's bathing suit with goggles and a shower cap with holes in it. And he popped and he hopped up into the air while wishing to a wizard in the tree right by the booth that he could be throw up because he because by anal thunder. Because by anal thunder for the time. Oh. Where am I? <laughs> um, then the choo choo engineer made a shower right before the sk- skier's eyes and he turned it on and he stepped in it and he was making funny noises and singing and then he stepped out and he was wearing a woman's bathing suit with goggles and a shower cap with holes in it and he hopped up into the air while wishing to a wizard in the tree right by the booth that he could be throw up by Throw up caused by anal thunder for the time length of five seconds. So that, so then the wizard in the tree grants him the wish, and he falls back through the booth window as anal thunder thro- 
throw up flowers and five seconds later he turns back into a choo-choo train engineer wearing a woman's bathing suit with goggles and a shower cap with holes in it he then battles other competitors in a reality tv tv show contest to be the next top model eventually after many times of re-entering the reality tv show contest he finally wins and beats the booth lady and then the maker of the magazine made it that if you lose your position of top model then you get kicked out kicked out of the magazine so then he so then she pops up into the booth f- from the magazine world. She has a tear in her eye and gives the skier a ticket to join the competition. He realized that he wasn't even late at all. So then he uh walks towards the competition area. He gets his gear from the gear shop that is uh that is right is to the right of the man milking lima beans for lima milk. The skier then comes up to the ski competition manager guy. He controlled the whole competition. He had a scientific calculator growing out of his back. And the scientific calculator was had grass growing on it. The grass was so long that it made a grass maze. The grass maze was pretty mazy. If you went there, you'd be lost. Not even the greatest navigators of the universe could escape from its ability to get people lost. So, then a Buddha statue earring that the man milking lima beans had came to life. He was uh, all green and stuff. He uh, hopped down onto the man milking the lima beans' shoulder. And then the Buddha statue earring met this soldier on the man milking the lima beans' shoulder. The Buddha statue earring asked, what are you doing here? Then the soldier said, I am here because I have been ordered by the soldier god to come to this man milking lima beans' shoulder. Then the Buddha statue earring asked what his name was, and he said, I'm shoulder soldier number two. The Buddha statue earring asked, why are you shoulder soldier number two? Then DSF Adversad D S F A D F S A D D D D D S F A D F A S A D came along. He was a typo. Typos were creatures that serenaded bookshelves by guitar. So D S F A D S A F A D F A S A D came up to the library. I cannot say what happens next because it's too graphic and inappropriate. But I'll say it anyway. So then D S F A D F A S A D stepped inside and then he fought his urge to serenade and he picked up and a book and read it so then in the end even though you were meant to do something it doesn't mean you have to do it so then after he read the book he started serenading all of the bookshelves and then they all got in a tiny gigantic sweaty and splintery orgy well the buddha statue earring then said then asked disif adversad if he wanted to come along with shoulder soldier number two, and him to the ski competition manager guy. So then he says, no. After a few seconds of kicking a dumpster in the back of Safeway, he says, yes. So then they journeyed towards the ski competition manager guy. They had to get off of the man milking lima beans' shoulders, so they so then they grabbed the jetpacks that were embedded into the man milking lima beans' neck skin. They didn't know how to turn the jetpacks on, so then they were like, screw it, and then they threw the jetpacks down and they were destroyed. So, then out of the man milking lima beans' ear comes Jose the Lizard. He comes up to them and says, you got... The dollar bills, I got the pills. He handed them pills, and then they gave Jose the Lizard a miniature lizard toy, and Jose the Lizard hissed in disgust. He camouflaged into the man milking lima beans' neck skin by embedding himself into the neck skin, and then Jose the Lizard turned into 69,028,235 jetpacks. So then the man milking lima beans had 69,028,235 jetpacks embedded into his neck. He started to choke and began to wonder how those jetpacks got there while he was choking. He thought about his wife, Cecilia. He thought about the wedding and when they wiped cake all over each other's faces and when Cecilia threw the flowers over her shoulder and Crever caught it, the man milking lima beans fell into the snow. He passed away. No one ever noticed him. He just kept getting buried and buried and buried by snow. But the three adventurers were stuck in the snow now. They were deep, buried deep. But luckily, 
Buddha's statue. Buddha's statue earring's tummy was very fat and warm, so the snow melted and they got out of the snow. But the dead corpse of man of the man who killed the but the dead corpse of the man who milked lima beans was pulled out of the snow by shoulder soldier number two, and then the dead corpse of the man who milked lima beans was to- tossed into space, and then Lance Armstrong saw the dead corpse of the man who milked lima beans, and then the Lance put him on his racing bike, and then Lance also sipped a Livestrong bracelet onto the dead corpse of the man who milked lima beans. Then Lance zoomed off to the stars, and to this day, on a really milky night, you can see the dead corpse of the man who milked lima beans riding Lance Armstrong's bike while wearing a Livestrong bracelet. I've never seen it personally, but my aunt has. So then the three adventurers were then walking towards the ski competition manager. Guy, leaf on the blowhorn, call the branch people, buy in trunk-wise.